Assassins are known for shooting their shot and disappearing into the night. But when your target is a head of state, then you can be sure a clean getaway is going to be much harder. Yet, when an attacker is apprehended, that tends to be the end of the story. The focus shifts to how the consequences of their actions ripple through time. Not about what happened, but what we lost when it happened. What did we lose? Hope. We never really wonder what happened to these figures the moment after they made history. So what exactly happens to a killer once they take down a president? What happens to a criminal decades after serving prison time? And is there any chance of rehabilitation? And if they can be saved, will society ever forgive them? Should they ever forgive them? These are tough questions, but given how world-altering the wrong man in the right place can be, it's worth investigating the lives of men who tried or did take the lives of others. Ronald Reagan was once the subject of an assassination attempt. The man that attempted to take his life is a free man today, and has a very interesting hobby that has allowed him to blend in with society. So it's time to learn how history works as we look at what happened to those who shot their shot at US presidents and where they might be today. John Wilkes Booth when John Wilkes Booth, a Confederate sympathizer and slavery supporter, tried to end the American Civil War by sneaking up behind the president with a pistol in hand, he ended up starting a nationwide manhunt that cemented Lincoln's legacy. Immediately after he emptied his gun in the back of Abe's skull, Booth fled out of the stage door and into the back alley where his getaway horse was waiting. From here, Booth trekked across the swamps and forests of the rural landscape, seeking shelter with friends or conning his way into strangers' homes. Despite the huge body count on his head and the nationwide search for him, Booth managed to stay one step ahead until coming upon a farmhouse belonging to the Garrett family. Here, he learned how the final Confederate army had surrendered. With no hope left, Booth planned to run to Mexico. By now, soldiers had caught up to the assassin, so Booth hid in a barn, refusing to surrender. So they lit the building on fire. Then, when Booth allegedly went for his weapon, he was put down with a bullet. His final words being, tell my mother I died for my country. Lee Harvey Oswald The man who shot JFK was a US Marine veteran with a troubled childhood before defecting to the Soviet Union in the 60s. In time, he would return to the US and work for the Texas Book Depository, which became his vantage point for committing one of the most famous assassinations of all time. Immediately after using his rifle, Oswald played it cool in the office, with colleagues seeing him drink a soda pop in the corridor. But then he ducked out and went to his boarding room to gather his things as a part of an escape plan. He almost got away until one officer spotted him at a bus stop and noted his resemblance to the description of the shooter. But when Officer Tipoid approached him, Oswald fired his pistol four times, taking the patrolman's life. The double killer was witnessed ducking into a movie theater without paying for a ticket. Initially, the police were called to throw him out, but a startled Oswald reached for his gun. Thankfully, the hammer got caught before he could fire it again. From here, Oswald was placed in handcuffs, although he initially denied involvement during his interrogations. But then, two days later, as police were escorting him to the van which would take Oswald to jail, Jack Ruby, a citizen outraged by the president's death, seized a window of opportunity and assassinated the assassin in full view of television cameras. Sirhan Sirhan Though Bobby Kennedy never reached the rank of nation leader, he was the 64th United States Attorney General who was slain at the Ambassador Hotel in 1968. He was in the midst of shaking hands with a 14-year-old hotel employee. He grabbed my hand, sh shook it, uh, took a step forward, let it go, and then I, I heard uh, what to me sounded like firecrackers. Uh, it was bang, 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 bang. When the gunman, Sirhan Sirhan, an anti-Zionist extremist, mortally wounded him. Immediately after firing his pistol, witnesses tried to wrestle the weapon from his hands, but this just resulted in more misfires and more injuries. Sirhan was immediately placed in police custody before he could break free. Initially, he admitted guilt in a recorded confession, and his lawyers made a plea deal for a guilty verdict in exchange for life imprisonment. However, Sirhan himself had told the judge that he wished to be executed. It's not every day that someone says that in the court of law. His defense team tried to paint him as a delusional man. The victim, then I, I feel that I eminently qualified to be paroled and all. But the scores of notebooks filled with the omissions of murderous intent didn't help them. It also didn't help that he was lucid during all his TV interviews throughout his time in the Slammer. Initially, he was supposed to be freed on parole in 1984, but following death threats he sent from prison, the California Board of Prison Terms extended it. Old habits die hard. That said, in 2022, he was due to be released, but he has been denied parole for the 16th time, no doubt because his lawyers now claimed he was framed, with Sirhan now arguing that he has no memory of the attack. Charles Gateau James Garfield hadn't been president of the United States of America for a year before he died from complications following the attack on him by Charles J. Guiteau. 
Gateau was a couple of sandwiches short of a picnic, to put it lightly. He believed he had personally helped Garfield win the election, so when the administration refused compensation for his imagined political debt, Gateau loaded a revolver and went to intercept the president as he waited at a train station. This was before the days of Secret Service, so ambushing the president as he was about to start his summer vacation was pretty easy. What wasn't easy was Gateau's escape. Upon firing, Gateau pocketed the pistol and casually walked to the cab waiting outside, only to collide with a police officer who was entering the building having heard gunfire. He was swiftly taken to the police station, where his ramblings and ravings fanned flames of conspiracy of Republican factions trying to rub out Garfield. But things only got crazier at trial. Gateau would insult his defense team, formatted his testimony in epic poems recited at length, and solicited legal advice from random spectators via notes in the courtroom. Needless to say, his claim that God had willed Garfield's death didn't get him off the charges. In fact, he danced on his way to Gallows and read out one last poem as the noose was put around his head. Leon Cholgosh This next entry also sees the end of a short-term American president thanks to his anarchist assailant, Leon Cholgosh. Following his job loss to the economic panic of 1893, Cholgosh seized the chance to push through his new world order when he pounced on William McKinley as he was shaking hands with people at the Temple of Music Exposition. Cholgosh was able to land two hits, but was tackled before he could unload a third. Bystanders and police dogs piled the hitman, although he managed to hold his own against the punches and kicks. In fact, the pummeling only stopped when McKinley, still lucid despite his bullet wound, ordered the men to stand down. Despite this tiny amount of mercy, the testimony from the many witnesses meant that when it came to the murder trial, Cholgosh was convicted. In fact, jury members said that they would have done it sooner than the 30 minutes it took them had they not been obligated to review evidence as per their civil duties. Cholgosh was given the electric chair. Strangely, his body was dissolved in acid before being placed in a casket. Maybe they just wanted to be sure the guy was gone? Animosity to anarchists followed soon after, with security programs eventually consolidating to create the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It's ironic then that this anarchist dream only created more government agencies. John Flaming Shrink It had been said by Teddy Roosevelt's peers that the Grim Reaper had come for him when he was sleeping, otherwise there would have been a fight. That's probably why this assassin was unsuccessful in his plot to knock off the 26th President of the United States of America. It happened on the 14th October 1912, when former saloon keeper John Flaming Shrink saw the President exiting a hotel. Strangely, he claimed to have been visited in a dream by the ghost of McKinley, who wished him to assassinate Roosevelt to avenge the schism in the party. Within moments of firing his weapon, he was disarmed and manhandled by the crowd, yet Shrink's bullet ricocheted off Roosevelt's eyeglass case and burrowed through his documents. Though the bullet did lodge in his target's chest, the president was well enough to demand that the police ensure no violence fell upon his would-be assassin. Good thing, too, because the crowd was trying their best to lynch him right then and there. Upon examination, doctors concluded that the drifting biblical scholar had delusions of grandeur and was pronounced nuttier than squirrel's droppings. He was admitted into a hospital for the criminally insane, where he remained for 29 years until his eventual death of pneumonia. John Hinckley Jr. The last entry on our list is the most recent assassin attempt, which went down in 1981 on March 30th when John Hinckley Jr. believed that shooting the sitting president would impress Hollywood actress Jodie Foster. Yes, really. A few bystanders also took some hits, but thankfully, the assailant was wrestled to the ground and the president whisked off to an emergency room. Though Reagan would make a full and speedy recovery, it took doctors a bit longer to assess the man who tried to rob him of his life. Not guilty by reason of insanity was the official verdict, with Hinckley remaining under institutional psychiatric care for over three decades. In fact, soon after being admitted into the asylum, he was determined to be unpredictably dangerous, with searches of his room yielding letters which proved he still had delusional attachments to Jodie Foster. It wasn't until the turn of the millennium that he was allowed to have controlled supervised visits with his parents. But according to a penthouse interview, his days were filled with shooting pool, therapy sessions, and eating lousy food. By 2011, his status had been lowered so that he was not seen as an immediate danger, but he still had a long road of rehabilitation ahead of him. He was released in 2016 to stay at his mother's home, albeit with strict rules such as not contacting Reagan's family, drinking alcohol, or deleting his web history. Could any of you pass all three of those? That changed on June 15th, 2022, when Hingley was granted full release from court restrictions. And I'm sorry to the Reagan family, the Brady family, the, the other families of the victims. He has since gone on to publicly apologize for his actions in a televised interview, and now uploads his songs onto his own YouTube channel. But no one is perfect. 
Taking out a nation-state leader seems like a bold strategy only to end you up in federal prison for the remainder of your years. But for nation-state leaders, taking out dissenters has provided them with an opportunity to strengthen their power. To find out why, watch our video on the 10 worst popes. Don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.